الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ويسقى الله سبحانه وتعالى that he makes it steadfast upon the religion for us and for the Muslim youth and that he gives us a good returning to our religion and that we have the best of returning to our Lord يوم القيامة This is the final session where we are looking from the book من مشكلات الشباب written by Sheikh Muhammad bin Salim Thaymeen and previously in the book in the introduction so a quick summary uh, in the introduction he talked about why this topic is important he said it's important for the Muslims he said it's important for the Ummah and it's important for the societies across the world because if the youth are corrupt Muslim or non-Muslim then it's going to affect the future generations so the topic is extremely important then in the next chapter he goes on to talking about the three categories of the youth today those who are practicing those who are not practicing and those who are confused then rahimahullah he talked about some of the things that are affecting the youth in the dunya some of the things that cause their deviation or perhaps cause them to be upright if they had certain characteristics about themselves and in the previous session we looked at as we said last week, some of the psychological issues that face the youth. But mainly the Sheikh was talking about the effects of shaitan. Final chapter, the Sheikh says here, Hira fil qadr. Deviation in matters of belief when it comes to the pre-decree. Now this is important because, as the ulama mentioned in the books of Aqeedah, many of the areas of deviation in Aqeedah stem from the inability to understand masail and issues connected to qadr and many of the deviant sects have deviated because of the fact that they have said something which is incorrect when it comes to qadr this doesn't necessarily mean that it's just about qadr there are issues in iman there are issues in isma wa sifat there are issues in other areas but ibn thaymin here is saying rahimahullah qadr is one of the pillars of iman and if the enemy Shaitan and his allies can attack this, then Iman is gone. So what is Al-Qadr? Qadr is to believe in four parts or four aspects that exist when it comes to Qadr. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew everything in eternity about his creation. From eternity he knew everything subhanahu wa ta'ala and he continues to know everything and he continues and will always continue to know everything subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second issue when it comes to Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recorded it in a preserved book. Everything has been written down. So he created the pen and he told the pen to write. The third issue or the third part of Qadr is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed everything to take place. And the fourth one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. These are the four areas when it comes to Al-Qadr. And the Shaykh is saying here, and the evidence for some of what we have said is the statement of Allah Alam Ta'alam Anna Allah Ya'alam Ma Fis Sama'i Wa Do you not know that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows everything in the skies and on the earth? Inna Dhalika Fi Kitab So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows Inna Dhalika Fi Kitab and it is preserved in a book Inna Dhalika Ala Allah Yaseer and all of this is easy for Allah in this we have the will of Allah and in this the fact that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala it is easy for Him to create Ibn Thaymeen rahimahullah says this is what the believer must have firm you know, foundations in and this is what we should be teaching our children as well and with this the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade us in getting involved in discussing issues theoretically religious theories especially when it comes to ideas which contradict the purpose as to why we exist and the things that we should believe in. So we have a hadith here in a Tirmidhi which is Sahih on the authority of Abu Hurairah. He said that we were sitting in the masjid and amongst the companions, Abu Hurairah used to live in the masjid, amongst us were companions and we were debating with one another issues of Qadr. So now here the companions are sitting in the masjid, the Messenger of Allah is in his home which is annexed, which is connected to the masjid. But they were there having their own private discussion. When the Messenger of Allah found out that they were talking about Qadr, he came out, Abu Hurairah is saying here, he came out and his eyes were red. 
Now, the Messenger of Allah wasn't an angry person. Even when he was angry, he wasn't angry. But you could see it on his face. And this is what Abu Huraira is saying here. This is the gentleness of the Messenger of Allah But when lines were transgressed, he used to become upset. So Abu Huraira is saying here, we could see the anger because his eyes were red. But his akhlaq and his demeanor remained the same. SubhanAllah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then he says, Halaka man kana qablakum. The people that came before were destroyed. When they started debating the same thing that you guys are debating in. And now I'm putting my foot down. I'm making it certain that you guys do, should not get involved in these kind of discussions. In this hadith, the Shaykh is saying, Muthaymeen, falling into theories, falling into alternative purposes, overthinking things is not permissible. And when a person does this, la khuruj minha. When a person does this, then he'll always be overthinking, overthinking, over, overthinking everything. To the extent, as we've seen last time, it becomes a psychological attack from the shaitan, then he starts overthinking about the things that he shouldn't even be thinking about, things which are fact which is the existence of Allah and the things that we should believe in. These are all factual things. So what's the solution? And Ruthaymin, Rahimahullah, is saying here, don't overthink these things. Don't get involved in these things. And he says, and and use your time and busy yourselves with those things which are beneficial. And to hasten in doing these things as you have been commanded to do. Now here, I just want to pause. The Shaykh is saying here, busy yourself in doing things which are good and do not use your time in doing things which are not beneficial. Now a person might then say, well, okay, that's good and I understand that things which are beneficial in my dunya, things which are beneficial in my deen, for my akhirah, these are the things that I should be engaging in as much as I can. And when I find myself thinking about things that I shouldn't be thinking about, I should be changing that. That's fine. That is the advice. However, we are living now in a time where it becomes extremely difficult for the Muslim to stop thinking about those things, to stop overthinking. So what do we do in that scenario? As we have seen in the previous sessions, the Shaykh has given us examples and solutions for that as well. Which is, I mean, there are a number of things, but from the pinnacle of them is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It might seem like a cliche that you just do dhikr of Allah and that's the answer that you'd expect to find in the masjid. But the dhikr of Allah is not necessarily that you are using your tongue and just remembering Allah. The dhikr of Allah are those things which will help you ponder upon things which are khair. Lectures, books, discussions, revising. And obviously it might involve reading the Qur'an and memorizing the Qur'an or just sitting there making dhikr, astaghfirullah. Thinking about your sins, astaghfirullah. Thinking about the greatness of Allah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah. Think about the things that Allah has given to you. In that, then the person is going to be positive. Because it's extremely difficult for this person to then overthink things and think about things which are not beneficial for this person. Therefore, the Shaykh is saying here, and tahris al khair. Make sure that you are using your time to do things which are of beneficial nature. If you are using your time on phones and discussions, reading things which are not beneficial, then you could find yourself in a trap. A trap where you then start questioning things which you didn't really need that questioning. But because you fell into it, now the Shaykh is saying here, it becomes extremely difficult for you to get out of it. To get those thoughts out of your head now because it should have just stopped in the first place. Ruthameen then says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you aql, number one. Then on top of that aql, he gave you revelation, a book. Then on top of that, he gave you a messenger to follow. Aql, book, messenger. Therefore, why would you need to indulge in areas which do not need for you to get into? Therefore, Ibn Thaymeen is saying here, Rahimahullah, be concerned with ilm and righteous actions and avoid what if how about what about when the messenger of Allah once was talking to his companions he said in a hadith this has been mentioned by the Shaykh here which has been reported by Bukhari he said that nobody of us 
exist except that his place in Jannah and his place in the hellfire have already been recorded. So the companions then ask, Ya Rasulullah, shall we not then just depend on that? If we've already been written to go to Jannah or been written to go to the hell, what's the point of us doing anything? And here's the point the Shaykh is saying here, I'malu, no, do good deeds, engage in doing good deeds, use your time in those things which are going to be best beneficial for kullun, muyassar lima khuliqala. Every single one of us will have ease shown on the path for what we have been created for. If you are from the people of happiness and bliss in the dunya and the akhirah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for you to do those deeds. And if you are from the people who are wretched in the dunya, wretched in the akhirah, may Allah protect us, then these people will have their deeds made easy for them. Then he recited the ayat from Surah Al-Layl, ayat number 5 to 10. As for those people who give and they have taqwa of Allah, husna and they believe in the husna. What's the husna? The ulama have said tawheed, la ilaha illallah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make his path easy to attain taqwa and husna. As for the person who was stingy and he thought that he doesn't need anything, he's arrogant. وَكَذَّبَ بِالْحُسْنَى And he denied لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ فَسَنُيَسِّرُهُ Look what Allah is saying here. We will make easy for him what is difficult. فَسَنُيَسِّرُهُ لِلْعُسْرَى We will make easy for him what is difficult. So the Shaykh is saying here, engage in things which are going to be beneficial for you and do not dwell into areas which do not need for you to dwell into. And if you were to do that, then it becomes extremely difficult for you to get out because now your aqeel has become corrupted. So the Shaykh is saying here, Rahimahullah, now he is using uh, aql and fitrah and ration as well. If a person sees something that he likes, what's he going to do? If a person sees something that he dislikes, what's he going to do? The Shaykh is saying here, we cannot use qadr as an excuse to fall short in the religion or reject the religion or to indulge in the life of this dunya and forget our purpose. If a person sees something which is khayr in matters of the dunya, they gravitate towards those things. They want those things. They have an inclination towards those things. And the same thing when it comes to things that they dislike. If they see something they dislike, they stay away. They abandon it. This is because every single one of us have been given free will and when it comes to issues of the dunya, we don't say, oh, well, it's been written anyway, so if I'm going to do good, I'm going to do good. If I'm going to do bad, I'm going to do bad. I've got no choice in it. So the Sheikh is saying here, rationally, this is what we do in our dunya. And how about when it comes to doing good deeds and staying away from bad ones? Then the Sheikh completes uh, this chapter and finishes the book by addressing two very important misconceptions which exist amongst the youth until today. Remember, the book was written you know, a couple of decades ago. So he says, misconception number one. Many of the youth, they say, okay, well, we don't want to follow the religion, we don't want to practice the religion, we completely abandon the religion because, like we have said before, they have indulged in qadr, or they say, what is the point? There's no point. The Sheikh has addressed those. But now he is saying here, here is another misconception, which is what they say is, if we've got free will, why do we need religion? If I've got the choice to do good and got the choice to do bad, why do we need to follow laws and rules? In answer, the Sheikh says, every single one of us have the ability and the want to do certain things. Your ability and your wanting to do certain things is based on your intelligence and what you know of that thing. When you know something is good for you, when you know something is bad for you, this then connects with your ability to do that thing or stay away from that thing. Therefore, your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you intellect and free will. But he is the same Lord that gave you religion and he told you, listen, this is the right way, now it's up to you if you want to do it or not. Therefore, we do need religion. And because we've got free will, it doesn't necessarily negate the fact that we need religion.
And perhaps we can add to this and say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us free will and he's given us religion at the same time and now he's going to test us. Maybe we can look at it that way. But the Shaykh is saying here, this is something that we need to explain to the youth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the ability to look or to lower your gaze, to eat or to refrain, to listen or to switch it off. And our children and as adults, as Muslim adults, we need to learn that, listen, if we knew that this thing was good, we would do it. If we knew this thing was bad, we would stay away from it. So how about your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that's telling you, it is good, do it. And he left you with the choice to do it. Nobody can then say afterwards, well, I'm not so sure, or maybe I should have, or maybe I shouldn't have. Another misconception, and the last one that the Shaykh is saying here, and this is also very important. Imagine, look, subhanAllah, he's mentioning something that people cannot understand until today, until the point that they don't understand it, they say, well, religion is not for me, it must mean God does not exist. And the Shaykh says this, what, 20, 30 years ago. He says, Rahimahullah, another issue that occurs because of people not understanding Qadr correctly, especially the youth, is they ask this question, how can Allah punish when he already has decreed that I'm going to sin in the first place? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew about you before you existed. He knew the option that you were going to take, whether you're going to do good deeds or bad deeds. So when you are going to do the bad deeds, they've already been written down that you're going to do the bad deeds. And how can he punish you for it? But he's the, old, he's the one that's already decreed it, Takha. Now here is very important. The Shaykh flips the question on its head. And he says the question is actually being biased. These kind of questions, the Shaykh is saying here, these kind of questions only come about with a person with a negative outlook. They are only looking at the sin and they are only looking at, you know, a negative or pessimistic angle and perspective. Similar to another question, they will say, if God exists, why is there so much pain? So the Shaykh is saying, no, no, let's turn it around and say, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knew that we were going to do good deeds, then why would he reward us for it? Or, in a better way, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that we were going to do good deeds, then this is a sign of his mercy. Switched it. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew there's going to be so much pain, why did he create it? But then we can say, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed there's going to be so much mercy, why don't we seek it? So those people who come up with all these theories and trying to attack Qadr, the Shaykh is saying here, a lot of these arguments are biased. And they negate the Rahmah and the justice and the wisdom and the ilm of Allah and they want to focus on something with a particular agenda. So the Shaykh is saying here, they're looking at a sin but they're not looking at the goodness. So they are saying, these bad things I do for myself, they're not my fault. Allah is to blame. But they're not saying, there's so many good things that I can be doing and I have done and I thank Allah for allowing me to do it. The Shaykh is saying here, this is precisely what the Quraysh came with when they were talking to the Messenger of Allah Wasallam. Now here, this is a very important point. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he comes to the people of Quraysh, he talks to them about Tawheed, La ilaha illallah for 13 years. His main focus of da'wah wasn't salah or being dutiful to your parents, fasting in Ramadan. His main focus for 13 years was La ilaha illallah. And it was just moments before he left Mecca that the five obligatory prayers were made wajib. Now we can understand that, we can understand that for most of his life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was talking about the oneness of Allah, La ilaha illallah. Now whilst he is talking to them about La ilaha illallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals these ayat. Sayyikul ladina ashraku, the people of shirk, meaning the pagan Arabs, they say, Lo Allah, ma ashrakna wa la abauna. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already willed and decreed, why are we mushriks? Why are we not already upon the religion of Ibrahim? What was wrong with our fathers and our forefathers? Why did he make halal and haram? When he knew that we're going to do the haram, why didn't he just create halal? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the Quraysh have denied, and this is exactly how the people before the Quraysh had denied also. Now here it's very important. These ideas that we see in society where people are questioning everything, does Allah exist? 
Did Allah get my genetics right so I need to change it? Qadr. Does the Sharia of Allah still apply? Do we need to change it? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? Constantly everything is why, what if, why, what if, why, what if. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, كَذَلِكَ كَذَّبَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ This is not nothing new. This is precisely the reason, or one of the reasons, one of the main reasons as to why any Nabi or Messenger was denied. Them falling into denial of Qadr, overthinking of Qadr. حَتَّى ذَاقُوا بَأْسَنَا Until our punishment came to them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the response to them. قُلْ Meaning, O oh Muhammad, this is your response now. هَلْ إِنَّكُمْ مِنْ إِلْمٍ فَتُخْرِجُوهُ لَنَا Do you have knowledge of what you are talking about so that you can actually deduce from these things that you are saying any kind of goodness? Now here is the point here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here. Number one, they are talking about things without knowledge. Number two, they are talking about things that they shouldn't be talking about. Number three, they are talking about things that has no precedence from the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But also, number four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, قُلْ هَلْ إِنَّكُمْ مِنْ إِلْمٍ فَتُخْرِجُوهُ لَنَا That it is all just guesswork. And there is no fact. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying there is no ilm involved here. إِنْ تَتَّبِعُونَ إِلَّا الظَّنْ You are only following theories. Theories after theories. وَإِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا تَخْرُسُونَ Here Ibn Thaymeen is saying here, if their argument was correct, what about this? How about that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have accepted it. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejected it and said that this is one of the reasons for your kufr and the kufr that came from people from before and this is the reason why they were punished. Also from this, as Ibn Thaymeen is saying here, from these ayat as well, we do not know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written. So a person might say, well, if there's so much pain that is happening, why is it happening? Where is the mercy of God? Or, if I'm doing something bad, that is because God wrote it beforehand, therefore it's not my fault. But do you know what God has written? Do you know what's in that book? No, you don't. Therefore, you can't blame what is in that book. How do you know goodness could have been written for you? So you can't blame something which you have no knowledge of. And I think this concludes, I mean the Shaykh continues, but I think this is enough because some of the things that he has said I think we've already covered. This concludes the chapter. Therefore the Shaykh is saying now here, Rahimahullah, the youth need our investment and we need to protect them. The greatest way that we can do this is by turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the only way. When we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people around us will also turn back to Him. Having ikhlas in Allah and doing good deeds brings about a barakah which has no limit. If we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will then become role models for our future generations. And as the Shaykh says in the introduction, if we do this, Islam will survive. If we don't do this, then we run the risk of Islam being reduced or at least the correct understanding of Islam being reduced. And it is not far-fetched for us then to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we have seen and it is recited over again in the Qur'an, that his patience and patience and patience continues. But when he wills and he decrees, he becomes angry. And he will will remove a group of people and replace people who are better than them. So if we don't reconnect, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll find people that will reconnect. If we don't have tawheed in ourselves, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring people that will. This is the reason why we've been created. And our youth are looking at us for that guidance. Our youth have been brought into this world with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are looking up at us and they are saying, okay, well, what do you want me to do now that I'm here? Why did you bring me here for? And it is upon the youth also to remember that the parents and the elders are the ones that they need to look up to. Not people on the same level, but people who are higher. Because those people who are higher, especially the parents, 
they are the ones through the permission of Allah for their very existence therefore it has to be something which is mutual every single one of us need to go back to the religion of Allah fall into the categories of khair as the Shaykh has mentioned here and advise one another and ask for Allah's protection in falling into deviation as the Shaykh has highlighted in this book and the Shaykh has done a fantastic job of explaining to us that all khair can only be found in what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam has left for us to follow and all deviation can only come about when we individually or collectively have moved away from following Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam this is what it is in a nutshell so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows us to have iman and taqwa and akhlaq with one another with the elder generation and the younger generation. Likewise, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he purifies our hearts from anything which is corrupting it and that he illuminates our insides and our outsides and that he makes us the beacons of truth in the dunya and in the akhirah. Allahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, next week we'll start a new book. And the Shaykh has got a really good book where he talks about the different fitan that exists in the world today. And again, the Shaykh passed away many many years ago but in this book he does a fantastic job of pinpointing a fitna and talking about that particular fitna so he talks about fitna of the opposite gender he talks about the fitna of the dunya he talks about fitna of halal and haram etc religion as well fitna of religion as well so inshallah that's the next book that we will start i will be starting that inshallah next friday after salat al maghrib as normal, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that grants us tawfiq in this also. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Shalom wa